now on the show, you got to work with some really great legendary people. My personal favorite is Sid Caesar uh, when he came on the show for a finale. Uh, but and, and we've of course we've talked about Robin Williams in the past uh, and Richard Simmons. That moment I think is is like the, the only time that. They almost had to clear the room. The audience was laughing so hard. Um, but another one of my favorites is Whoopi Goldberg. What was it like working with Whoopi? Uh, Whoopi was lovely. Um, and it's weird. You know, we had two Oscar winners on our show. Right. Uh, Robin and, and Whoopi. And Whoopi, um, again, and for both of them, I did, this was, you know, they were both riding high and they decided to do our little show. And mm -hmm. Whoopi was uh, incredibly generous and lovely. And we ended up doing more stuff with her. Like, uh, we did Hollywood Squares with her, uh, the whole cast of Who's Line. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, incredibly generous and fun, liked to have fun, wanted a good laugh. And that's all you really want when you meet someone just <laughs> Someone who wants to have a good time. There was no, I'm a star, I'm an Oscar winner. It was just, I'm one of the gang, which is great. And to me, Whoopi is a hero because she is the first person that I've ever seen do a, a routine that not only is funny, but very touching and paying homage to a disabled person. And she does it in a funny, mm -hmm. but very, very uplifting way. And I... If I ever get to meet her, I will tell her that, you know, she is one of my personal heroes because of that. And that uh, changed my life in ways that we won't get into today. But but uh, I've always adored Whoopi Goldberg for that. And, of course, she was great on the show. You got to kiss her, I believe, as I recall. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I didn't kiss her on the show, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Want a little bit of mockery. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Florence Henderson even uh, quoted on the back of your book that you were an incredible kisser. So apparently that got around well, that got around Hollywood very fast. Yeah, and yet I'm still not in romantic comedy. So yeah, I don't know what Hollywood I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think Brad's idea to have a film noir with the entire cast of Who's Line, I think, is a brilliant idea. I would, I would pay to see that in a minute. Um, yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, I mean, there's always been every once in a while talk comes up of us doing uh, something together in the past, but it's just getting everybody's schedules and uh, actually getting someone to sit down and write something for us. That's where it always falls apart. Well, I'd I'd be willing to try, but I don't think I'd you'd get very far on my skills. But I, I'd be I'd even be willing to take a stab at it if no one else would. So, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll do that and send it to Jeff, and we'll see if we get anywhere with it. Um, yeah. But um, you also worked with some people on that show who wound up being future legends, sort of like. Stephen Colbert, you know he's mm -hmm. he's he's doing the David Letterman thing. But every time I watch him, every time I see him on TV, I think, well, that's the guy that cracked me up on this line because that guy could sing and dance and 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 um, do all kind of crazy stuff on on whose line is anyway. I think he was only in that one episode, but he was terrific. So yeah, yeah. What? Uh, no, yeah. Again, lovely, lovely guy. And so, have you, um, uh, like, have you been on his show or anything like that? Have you kept in contact no, with him? No, no, exactly. What is that about? I mean, we were on Who's Line together. We were both in Second City, he in Chicago, and me in Toronto. So you would think, you know, he'd yeah. reach out. Yeah, I would think so. I think he needs to remember his roots. Exactly. He's, yeah. he's changed so. Much. Yeah. He's, He's, it's gone to his head now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, here's if any of the 12 people listening to this podcast uh, know Stephen Colbert, tell him that Colin and Zach said you should reach out. Colin should be on the show. If you make it now, don't forget me. No, absolutely not. No, 
you will definitely be the first story I tell. Yeah, yeah. If you make it, say this this country guy from this country guy in a wheelchair from Mayberry helped me get on your show. So yes, that that'll be my claim to fame, and I can I can die relatively fulfilled then. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, so your first you got your first laugh in a high uh, in a high school play somebody persuaded you to do that um mm -hmm. but when did you discover this whole other alter ego this whole other character that developed um, for whose line is it anyway, the column mockery that everybody sees that obviously you're not when you're at home at the dinner table. Yeah, I um, was in theater school. I was just finishing up there and a friend of mine was in a play reading and part of the evening was there was this thing called theater sports, which was improv done in uh, sort of a sports um, setting. There was a referee who would issue challenges. The teams would then uh, do it like a best scene uh, in a date or something. And then um, referees would judge it from one to five. And I just thought it was like the best thing I'd ever seen. It was like fun, it was spontaneous. It was like, oh, it's amazing. They're just taking what we give them and coming up with a scene. So. Um, I got involved with that group and it became like a big um, late night cult thing in Vancouver where there'd be lineups around the block at, you know, 1130 at night to come see this improv show. And it was during that time that I guess I sort of honed this guy <laughs> that I, I do. And then uh, shortly after that line and I uh, had moved to Toronto, we were in Second City for a while. In the Second City, you get the chance after the main show to do uh, improv. So I took those improv set, uh, sessions to sort of work on things I didn't feel confident with. Like I never felt confident talking, talking to audiences. So um, part of the improv for Second City is at the beginning of or at the end of the show, you get a bunch of suggestions because we would use those to try to get scenes for the next show we we're going to do. So I would say, hey, if anybody needs to stall, get ready for something, um, I will introduce your scene. And I would use that time to sort of get comfortable talking to an audience and having fun with them and finding ways of getting around whatever my fear was. So between theater sports and uh, Second City, it was like a, um, it was like a college course on how how to get funnier and how to be comfortable in your skin. So, uh, did you know that this guy was always in you, this character, or did he just appear out of nowhere and then you think back or you see yourself on TV and wonder, who is that? Yeah, I mean, I, even though I was very quiet, I, I always felt I was funny and I... I was drawn to comedy. And when I was in theater school, the comedic parts were the part that um, I, I felt I did best in. Mm -hmm. With improv, though, it, uh, improv released something that, um, you know, having to stick to a script uh, doesn't. When, when you're doing a script, you have to basically get the writer's intentions out and you can still certainly get laughs uh, doing that with some of the, the, the great plays that have been written uh, throughout the years. But there was something about these laughs are mine and the people I'm working with. These are coming from deep within us uh, somewhere. And there was a freedom about that. There was um, all shame was gone because the evening was, we're making it up, you know that we have nothing, so we're going to do everything we can to make you laugh. So it was it was very freeing, and it was surprising that that guy uh, came out, because I didn't think 
I thought maybe he could have been there, but then when he started making full appearances, mm-hmm. it was it really was a, a, an experience of freedom I'd never had before. And and I I've heard you say in in other interviews, you know, I really I I don't like people. I you know I. <laughs> um, so how do you? as someone like having to talk to me and you've been so generous with your time and given me almost 40 minutes of your time already, how do you muster up, uh, if it's the courage or the, or I'm just going to suffer through this or as, as your career is dependent upon reactions of other people, um, Mm -hmm. how do you, uh, um, Temperament yourself, I guess, is the word. Um, it's, I mean, it's sort of like anything else. You have to uh, learn. I mean, part of my thing with people is I, I'm incredibly shy, so I, I'm, I always feel uncomfortable. But because of the success of Who's Line, I, I had to learn to um, be relaxed enough to give interviews on television, on radio, on podcasts. Also, I had the benefit of my my wife is an incredibly social person. She is the total opposite of me in that she loves people. She loves to hear their stories. She loves talking to them. So from her, I learned uh, sort of the tricks of the trade of actually listening to people. And um, it's it's just a different type of improvising. Uh, you know, our conversation right now is totally unprepared. We're just going along. So it's, it becomes more fun than thinking, oh, I have to go. This interview is going to be work. It's not. It's just another type of improvising where I'm playing off what the interviewer is asking me and what we're doing. And it can go in different tangents. So, I mean, over the years, I've, I've certainly gotten better. I don't think I'll ever be totally comfortable because there's also something about talking about yourself all the time. And I think, oh, I... Sometimes I feel, uh, I think Nick Nolte used to um, make up things for every interview. Mm-hmm. Just so he has something different to say. And I, I haven't gotten that courageous yet to just totally make up incredible stories. But I, I, I also, I, I feel more relaxed listening to people talk than actually talking about me. Right, right. And, uh, and you know, I hope I've asked intelligent enough questions, not ones that you're asked 10 times a day. Um, I I try to do my homework with these questions. So I can say at least that you said this is improvisation. So now not only can I say that I am friends with Colin Mockery, but I have done improv with Colin Mockery. Exactly. Uh, Yep, add that to your resume. I have done improv with Colin Mockery, yes. I certainly will do that. And when you went to theater school, you know, improv was not what it was, but really before Whose Line came, at least in America, or or as as most American people know it. Um, so what? Uh, so when you went to theater school, what were you aiming for at the time? Um, I just wanted to be an actor, and I thought, uh, you know, I'd be um, a, a character actor. I, uh, comedy um, mm-hmm. would be my my, my sort of uh, strong point, and that was as far. I just wanted to be a working actor. That was all mm-hmm. the plan I had for my future. So um, I've been incredibly fortunate with, um, you know, the people that I've known. Uh, you know, because it's because of Ryan I got onto Who's Line. Um, I've had people, uh, friends of mine who are now in the position where, you know, they can write movie scripts and uh, cast me in it, giving me parts that I wouldn't normally be cast in, in, in mainstream Hollywood stuff. So I, I've been very fortunate and, um, I, I thank my lucky stars every day. Do you like acting such as guest spots on the Drew Carey show and things such as that? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, it's a, a totally different muscle, uh, but yeah, it's it's a different challenge because uh, you know when we're doing Who's Line, you really don't have to make sense. 
Mm-hmm. If you actually transcribe most of our scenes, you go, what is this? Right. It's just uh, ramblings. Whereas, you know, with you know, sitcoms and movies, you know, there's a through line. There's a, you're there for a, a reason to get a particular reaction either out of a character from the audience. So it's a different, it's a different mindset. It's a different discipline. But I, yeah, I do enjoy, uh, I enjoy both. I would say I probably enjoy the improv more only because we're more in charge of it. You know, when right. you're doing movies or television, you've got the director, you've got the writer, you've got the producers, and everybody has their, um, you know, two cents to put in. So uh, with improv, you know, you, you live and you die because of what you've done, not because of what someone else has put upon you. Right. And uh, I'll never forget Brad saying that they asked him what his most embarrassing moment was. And he said, one time my chair fell off the back of the stage, but it wasn't embarrassing because it got a laugh and I didn't have to work for it. Um, so it's, it's just, it just amazes me that, that, you know, that you can, it just comes so naturally and it's not it's not like work for you it is work but it's not because it, you're doing what you want to do you're doing what you've always wanted to do and what you can do like no one else can do and that's an amazing thing to me yeah it's an amazing thing to me the fact that i'm uh, making a career out of something that wasn't a career when i was growing up right and again all because of uh, luck, all because of this little British show that came out of nowhere, sort of caught the imagination at the right time with the right group of people. So, um, yeah, no, it's just one. I'm certainly not complaining. Right. And obviously, if you've toured for 23 years, audiences are still anxious to see it and anxious to see what you can come up with. I know I'm very anxious for Bristol on March 29th. Very happy to have my tickets. Uh, they said, just so you know, we do not uh, we do not allow you to do any backstage meetings. So I don't know if I will get to say hello this time. But know oh. but know that I will be rooting for you from the third row or wherever they've put me on the corner there. All right, I'll keep an eye out for you. Yes, because uh, uh, as I said, I'm a lifelong big fan. Big fan. It was a thrill to have met you uh, once in Winston-Salem. You were very nice. You and Brad came out at the end of the show. And I'll never forget that moment. Thank you for that. Um, And uh, just one final question before we go. What is your funniest bit? Or what are you... Is there a funniest bit or a, a funniest... Something that you did that was... You think that's the funniest thing I've ever done? Can you recall that? Wow. Okay, that's a okay. That's a tough one. Um, um, I can't. I can't think of anything specific. The ones I remember are the ones that I think that was really funny, but nobody appreciated it. <laughs> I, I can't think what, what it was. Uh, yeah, there have been some jokes where I I uh, go oh. You know that it was a, that was like a beautifully constructed joke, mm-hmm. but it was totally improvised. Mm-hmm. And uh, those are the moments I, I'm proud of. There's there are some moments in the greatest hits with Ryan and I, where I look and go, that looks like it's scripted. It looks like because it it goes through almost a perfect setup of right, a perfect setup to a joke, and that's the perfect punchline to the joke. Um, so things like that, and uh, yeah, so most of my things are things that are with other people. But, um, but, nobody, that's kind of, that's but what, nobody got it. The funniest ones yeah. to you, nobody got. And Where I was too funny for the room. Yeah, and if you, will, if you will read your book, what you have written, you know, it's it's not, you know, it's not slapstick. It's very intelligent. You have to know a little bit about the story itself uh, that you're borrowing from the first line, last line, um, and it's it's very intelligent, very eloquent, eloquently written, and 
you have to, you know, you have to have half a brain to be able to get the jokes. And I'm sure I didn't get all of them because I'm not familiar with all those stories. But some of them, like the the Frankenstein chicken, I was laughing and crying at the same time because yeah, that, that was my favorite one. Yeah. Yeah. Because Evelyn did die, and Franken was so distraught that he that he <laughs> he went away, and that destroyed you. You had found you had found uh, Gretel, but you were destroyed because you couldn't save your friend the chicken, and that bond was real. <laughs> I mean, you really covered the whole gambit of emotions. It, it was all a, a joke. I mean, I, th- I honestly thought at the end of the story that Grill was going to turn against you and, and fry Franken up, but she, you know, but it didn't turn out that way. It was a, it was a very moving story. and it was Well done. Well, I thought there, was, there was a market for a story about a man and his love for a chicken. And, and uh, you know, and what should be a a routine um, at my house every Christmas. I should read your uh, time travel with the night with the night before Christmas, where you include all the Christmas classics like your Christmas Carol, which is my personal favorite of all time, uh, mm-hmm. and and you know and 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 it's hilarious from start to finish. But you pay homage to so many Christmas classics in that poem. That I I just thought it was genius. I don't understand why it didn't sell ten million copies. But uh, uh, but it's it's well. My copy of your book is well worn at my house. If that means anything to you. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate. It. Um, and I know you said that people, um, you know, if you transcribed a Who's Line show, that uh, people would think it wouldn't make sense, but I have to admit to you that my wife and I, uh, the few episodes that have been put on DVD, we've watched over and over again, and we often sing over and over again those songs that Wayne and Brad made up because they were just (laughs) so brilliant, you know, but we, we, we sing them sometimes. I don't know if I should... Uh, Perhaps you should get some medical help. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, well, we do, we do see, we do see a counselor regularly. But yes, <laughs> we, but yes, but uh, that's we do enjoy those because I mean oh, Wayne Wayne Brady and your partner Brad Sherwood, as you say often, some of the most talented people on the planet, uh, along yeah. along with. Uh, Jeff Davis and Chip Eston. Uh What is Jeff Davis doing these days? Um, well, he, Ryan, Greg Proops, and Joel Murray have a tour, uh, who's live anyway, where they uh, go around the country. So everybody's touring and whatever else comes along. Jeff and I actually just did a movie together that uh, we're trying to get released called Villains. Uh, Villains Inc. about uh, sidekicks, the supervillains who their uh, supervillain gets killed and they have to find another way to make a living. Oh, well, I hope it gets released. I'll be happy to promote it here in uh, the mountains of Virginia for you if it does. Thank you. Um, well, so thrilled that you're coming to South- Southwest Virginia. Even more thrilled that I get to talk to you again. Um, as I said, the three times that I've done it is the highlight of my 20-year career. So God bless you for that, Mr. Mockery, and thank you for always being so generous and kind with your time. It's it's a blessing. Oh, thank, thank you. It's a blessing to say that I know you, and and uh, you were always very kind to say that you enjoyed my interviews that you liked my questions i hope i didn't let you down this time no, absolutely not how could you well I I, how could you? I I said last time that when you complimented me i said oh i need to put that in in writing that he likes 
my interviewing skills, and Brad said, oh, you don't want his recommendation, but I, but I would love to have it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So uh, thank you for thank you for your kind words. Thank you for your generosity. Anytime. Oh wow, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much.